last two weeks that we discussed about the what is the computer architecture based on that the what is the operating system. It was just the introduction of the operating system. So we have seen the definition of operating system and uh, what is the basic component that consists of the uh, operating system, including interface and kernel and uh, other, other system core part. So based on that, uh, we had a very simple exercise that it was uh, just uh, the uh, introduction of the, the new operating system for those who, um, who do not have the experience on using the Linux or the Unix system. However, that cannot cover the each and every details of the oper new operating system. Uh, your the effort and uh, uh, times are required. Please uh, try to get used, especially for the interface part. Uh, it is based on the command line interface. However, the, even though you uh, do not, uh, if, even though you have a lot of experience on the uh, graphical user interface, but the, in the real life system after your graduation, most of many of the project actually use the, a lot of the uh, command line interfaces. So it is a good opportunity to get used to such a command line interface. Also, the, I strongly suggest to use the, the uh, VI interface for your the editing. So it's also good for you uh, for future the experience. So based on that, uh, we, uh, from this week, we are going to start to discuss about the, uh, the three main uh, part of the operating system, mostly the first half of the semester before uh, the midterm exam, before the spring break. So we are going to talk about the process management. And the secondly, the we are going to talk about the memory management, as well as the I.O. management. These three are the main components, as we discussed before, the, of the operating system. So uh, before that, the, some of the students uh, asked me after the exercise that, do I need to use the Debian OS only for the, no, you don't have to there, as I have shown before. There are a lot of the various versions of the uh, Linux and the Unix system. You can, you, as long as you use the same, the share, the interface, or best share, coin share, C share, the depending on share, so you can use the other operating system. They have the little bit different name of the command, most of them provide the same functionality. So it's uh, not a big problem to use other operating system if you are already familiar with or if you are interested. Also, those who are scared to install the uh, Linux or operating system, the other operating system, or the I have a problem to use the uh, virtual machine. Also, this is the another option to for your practice. So you can use the Sigwin. Sigwin is not the operating system is just a Unix-like the interface for the uh, Windows system. Okay, so if you uh, download and uh, install the Sigwin, it's uh, just a terminal, and this is uh, just the interface. It looks like the there they are using the uh, shell programming type shell programming type the interface. However, actually the behind it execute the Windows the executable file. So for example, if I it provide like the PS command or the LS command or PWD, so most of the uh, the command, the Unix command are supported in SIGWIN. However, actually the it execute the Windows file if you type the notepad, so notepad it the launch the Windows the program. Okay, it's just nothing but the command line interface, Unix-like the command line interface. So those who want to use, those who are scared to install the uh, the virtual machine or the uh, Unix or the Linux machine, this is another option for your practice. Uh, throughout the semester, the, we are going to have the four or five time exercise slide. There might be no problem to use the, this one. So, however, sometimes you need to install the proper package like the uh, GCC or the CC compiler to use the Sigwin. So, after you install the such a package, there is no problem to use the uh, Sigwin to then use the other another operating system. However, this is not the operating system. This is just nothing but the interface, Unix-like interface for the uh, <coughs> Windows system.
Then the, today we are going to start learn the what is the process. This is the basic the data structure uh, of the operating system. We have the last class so we have seen the what happened when you turn on the system. So eventually the system so we we'll check the, all the devices and hardware using the BIOS program and the BIOS program. The Unix and the Windows basically they have the same mechanism, but the Windows has one more step. Windows point to the the master boot record that is reside on the hard disk right, the file system. Except that it is the same idea. There is the the. A boot thread, the bootloader program, the, through the bootloader program, it will launch the kernel program. So each the the Linux and the Unix system they provide the uh, command or the program that you can check the what kind of the program modules are the included in the kernel. So this is the one of the example. So this is an LS mode command in Debian, the, the Linux system. If you uh, learn the, that, you don't have to worry about the name of the command. Do not memorize. Just uh, keep your mind there might be the way to check the module that are included in the kernel. For example, in this, the, your the virtual machine, the Debian OS. So where's the? Problem is the uh, resolution are different from the this projector and the output signal. This so sometimes I cannot find the proper location of the my mouse. That happened the last semester, so only this projector <laughs> caused the problem. So I'm going to use them. So it's LS mode, and uh, if you type the more, the so these are the module and program, okay, included in your kernel. So this set of modules are the loaded into the memory that is the, the booting of the Unix system. Then the, the each one has the size of the third column is the program that are using, okay, that are using the this module. So you can see the number, the number is the process ID that we are going to discuss. In other words, when you start your the Unix system, is that the, uh, in other words, when you load your kernel to the memory, that uh, memory, so that will start the process, okay? So we need to know what is the process, right? So then, the each process the will use such a module to, for what? the main part of the operating system between the hardware and the user. So, what is the process? We have talked about a uh, little bit the last class, right? Process is? It's a program in the memory. It's also in terms of computer scientists, it is set of instruction. It's a data structure, okay? It's also format. Anyway, the, we need to use the computer resources. That is our ultimate goal, right? So computation power or the some things, the storage. So as a user, we'd like to use the computer resources. So how can we use? We need to op something program, software, right? So that is the operating system. That is a set of operating system. What operating system can do is operating system can create the process, in other words, the user already could such a bunch of the module, okay, make the software and compile and uh, include into the into the kernel, then load into the memory. Then computer should understand such a module and the program. How can the computer can understand, especially the CPU? CPU, each vendor of the CPU, like the IBM chip or the Intel, when they design the CPU. They design, they decide a number of command, number of instructions that can be supported by each chip. Each microprocessor, each CPU has the different number of types of the instruction command, like the 100 command, or the 
small the microprocessor has the 10 to 20, while usually it's around 180, 200 the command. Those are the commands that your computer chip, computer processor can do. The using the this the instruction, we can make the assembly code that program. So because it is hard to code the directly assembly, so we can use the high level language compile it and include it in the, into the kernel. Then how can we the use of such an instruction? How can the CPU can access such an instruction? Only way is the through the memory, right? So, from the CPU point of view, so this is the memory, and this is the CPU. So CPU would like to access the instruction, like the ID one move, the R1, R2, the subtract. So, so this instruction, that are available for this CPU. So CPU would like to read such an instruction from the memory. So this is already loaded into the memory. However, the CPU, how can CPU know the where the instruction is located? Using only way is the address. So you can see that when you learn the assembly code, it's a lot of the register and the memory. Okay, memory. Nothing but the, actually the memory is nothing but the address. So, how many process? Even the here, the when you load your the kernel into the memory, is it only the one process? We will see later. But so a lot of the process will be created. So, this the CPU. How does the CPU? So using address, so they can access it. However, whether this the instruction is for the which program? We don't know. So we need to organize such an instruction by the set of program that is the process. Then we need only the location of the, this one, the instruction. Sometimes when we compute process such an instruction, we need additional information, like the, for example, if I define the array, the integer array, like the 10 and 10. So these are not instructed yet, but this will be the temporary space that we are going to assign, okay, later. So we need more space to the store the such a data when we execute the process. So not only just the set of instruction to the, for the process, but we need more space in the memory. So how to organize such a the space in the memory? That is the process. Okay? In other words, process is a data structure. By the way, who defines such a data structure of the process? Operating system? Operating system. Operating system? Who else? Memory. Memory? CPU. CPU. So that is the reason, even though we have the same, the source code, we need to compile. If you are using the dual core, if you are using the, the AMD process, we need to compile it again. Okay. If you just copy, you cannot. Some, some of the simple program may be running, but most of them is not running. Why? Because each CPU, each processor has a different, different data structure for the process. Okay? So then how do we know? So do we need to know the everything about the CPU data structure for each CPU? Instead, we can project the compiler. Compiler is the program that understands the such a data structure, so we don't have to, if we compile the source code, then it will, the, the compiler will understand the data structure of this one process, so it can fit to the, the their specification, so we don't have to worry about it. However, if you are using the virtual machine, Java virtual machine, Java, so Java is running on the operating system, so it doesn't matter this is a virtual machine, this is a Java application. So it doesn't matter 
each CPU, each operating system you are using, as long as uh, you compile with the Java compiler. Okay, that's the default one. So, problem is how this data structure, how the process is organized. So today we are going to see such a structure of the process and the, what is the process today. Okay. Best way to learn the process structure, process management is the compiler. If you are learning the compiler, because in your compiler program, if you design and develop the compiler program, you need to know details of this one. Otherwise, your source code, the compiled binary code, will not fit to the, your the memory and the CPU, the specification. So that's the, one of the best ways. to learn the CPU, but the, in this class we will see the process structure. Okay. So, what is a process? Sometimes uh, in this class, in this uh, textbook, when I'm saying, when the textbook is saying the process, process means so it's a job, or user program, or the task. So interchangeably, we are going to use the, the job or the process and the task or the sometimes the program. Okay? However, if we specify the user program versus the process, the user program is the subpassive. Actually, the, in terms of instruction, they are the same, but the, the, we cannot do anything with the executable file, the program itself. Once we execute, once we load that such an instruction into the memory, then we can use such an instruction. So detail, the, precisely the process is an active program. It's a running program, but uh, sometimes uh, without the, uh, the, if I do not uh, mention the uh, detail, uh, even though I'm saying the program, program means it's a process and a task, so don't uh, be confused. Okay? So, so in this uh, textbook, job, process, and program, we can use the, the uh, interchangeable. So process is the program, it's in the execution, load it into the memory, so that is a process. That is not only the program code itself, it's it, which is called the text the section. So not only just uh, the text section is a programming code, but also it has a lot of information. For example, the program code counter, program counter means the CPU will not process the sequence, a series of instructions from start to end, right? Instead, we have how many processes? Many processes is running in the same operating system. So we need to I need to take care of his the question. Then from the end of the class, sometimes I take care of the another. So sometimes I need to change it. So I need to know where is the next instruction of the program. Next instruction of the program, that is called the program counter. Program counter is also managed in the one of the register in your the CPU. Also, that should be managed in your the process structure. Also, there are the two area, main area of the process. One is the step, one is the hit step. You learned in your the long time ago, data structure class, right? Stack is top to bottom, right? So first in, last stop. Last in, first stop. So that is the step. So where did you use the stack data structure? Do you remember? For example, the microprocessor class. Anyone? So, for example, the CPU So this CPU has the processor and also storage. That is called the register. Okay? Nice. I'm not very good at memorization. It has the RC, RA, and something like that, right? So it has the storage. It's a register, okay? So this one is used for the process, the notepad, 
get root pair. So it has uh, all the information here. Then, if I change it, if the CPU process other program like the word, that exe, you need to change all the information about the register, right? For the new program, how? At that time, you can use pop all, okay? So I push all, push all of into the stack area, right? Do you remember that? Then it bring the new process there, the register information pop all. Then you can keep all the information here. So actually stack is used a lot in the computer system. One of the reasons, fast, right? The, do you remember the Q and the stack? R is a, one of the fastest, the data structure comparing to the linked list or the other because it has only, there's no update, it's just a read and delete and the insert, that's it. Okay, so it's a very fast data structure. Because of that, we can use the such a step. It's a perma, usually it's a temporary information. Because we are temporarily keep the such a, for example, the register information, so it's a use for the temporary information. Then, keep, keep is going bottom to up, okay? So it is used for the Data, dynamically increase data because we can just uh, the current position from the memory over the dynamic. For example, what? Array data. Okay, array data, you can the assign the, the pointer of the others that will be growing up from the bottom that is used for example, the heap area. Then the data section, because the program has a lot of the variable, right? Yeah. Not only just the local variable that is used, then that's it, but the, we have the global variable. So for the global variable, it's so important in your programming. So what did you learn in your programming class? Glo the more global variable is the better? No. Definitely not, no. right? Why? But it's easy, right? So you don't have to worry about the permission just to define the global variable and accessing by other. There are two reasons. One is this global variable will reside on the data section. So will be will occupy the space until end of process, unlike the temporary space. Another it can be Obsessed. As long as you are in the in your program, it can be obsessed any module, anywhere in your program. So sometimes you may not realize it's changed by others. Okay? So that is the reason global the less for your better performance of the, your programming. Okay, so these information are the basic information basing the data structure that are included in the memory who will see DK. Okay, how they are organized in the program. Okay, so this is the process that we are going to discuss. Usually, in case of the practical user interface, you can double click to start your the to create your process. Also, in your the the command line interface, you can type the command as you have done before in your exercise lab, so there is no problem. Also, one program is always one the process. No, sometimes one program can create the several processes. For example, in your the exercise uh, warming up exercise lab, the, you will create the one process, then this process will create the three child processes. Okay, so the so one or more the program, uh, the process will be created the, by the program. Then, this is a comparison between your high level language and the assembly code. This will be stored at the data section of the, your process, a text section, text section of the, your program. Okay, so it's just uh, the simple example. Did I code it? No, so I just copy and paste. So from this, this is my 
Then the, after I compiled it, I copy and paste the assembly code. So then the, this code will be loaded into the one part of the, your process structure, that is the text part. Okay? So this is a uh, overall. Usually when I the illustrate the memory, it's a zero to FFFF. FFF means it's not exactly value, it's just uh, the highest uh, the uh, address of the memory, so it's the low the zero to max, then the this is the uh, process data structure who determine the depending on your CPU processor. Okay, so sometimes it can be the as a default 32K, it can be 64K, and it depends on your the CPU, not depending on the operating system. Even operating system depends on your the process. By following that, the processor, the, it uses the same data structure. That because of that, if you change your the CPU or if you, if I'm using the same exactly same the operating system, but if you are using the different the uh, CPU, you need to compile it again. Because of that, this main problem is this. That consists of the four main part. Any process has the, uh, the four main part, but uh, depending on the uh, CPU may be different, but uh, basically the, this uh, part. The so text is, as I explained, that this, the, uh, some, uh, this code instruction code will be loaded into the memory. So that's what we know for the process. Not only just the, uh, the instruction, but also it has the data part. So global variable, then, as well as a heap and stack area. Okay. What is a garbage collection? Now, because one of the problem of the high level, the language, program language is you are not. So you don't have to worry about, you don't uh, pay attention to, to the housekeeping job, right? So it's so simple and it's a high level, so it's easy to uh, code, but sometimes you uh, do uh, understand what's going on inside. For example, this is a temporary space, right? But until sometimes in the middle of a process, so like the, if you are using the certain function or the uh, the inside uh, the the block in the in, inside the block part, then that will use the, this stack area. But the, once you complete the specific function or the uh, inside the block, that area will not be used, right? So if you need to be accessible throughout the, your process. You need to use the global variable. So, how can we? The what about the space that is used for the uh, previous function should be free. Okay. So, however, the process itself sometimes do not know which one is available, which one is not. Why? Because the post memory itself is nothing but address. Sequence of, if you know the address, you can access the data. Sometimes the, you don't know whether this area is available or not. It can be actually freed by another process. Usually the program, the language, they provide the garbage, the compiler provide the garbage collection. So that just to check whether this is available, the data or not. Then if not, then it will return the change the bit, then the, your process will use reuse such area to save the memory space. Okay, that is a garbage collector. Java also provides a garbage collector. So you mostly you don't have to worry about it. it's automatically they'll collect the, such a garbage data, then free and the reuse. But the, sometimes you should be able to use the GC, the garbage collector, then manually. The free the space and use it. Okay. Many of the C programmer forgot the after you allocate the memory like the envelope, then the the don't uh, pay attention to the free the space. So you can uh, the use such a garbage collector explicitly to free the space. Okay. And this heap area will be used for the dynamically the increase 
the dynamically needed the spaces such as the uh, uh, what is the array data. Okay. Then we know what is the process then in the operating system. So operating system, when you start up your process, there might be the first process. Mostly such a process is the called the any process in the Linux or Unix system. The name is the initialization of your operating system. So it's called the init. So this is usually either 0 or 1 the, as the process ID. Each process has their ID actually the operating system recognizes the each process as a name. No, it's just the ID number. What about the file? How do you recognize your file using file name? Right? Operating system recognize your file as the file ID. Actually, file descriptor. Okay. So, so that is the return value. Whenever you create the file or the open the file, that is. The process is the same. So process ID is identification uh, for the operating system. So then this process will create even when you start up, as we you have seen the list of the module in the uh, kernel, there are several functionality. Okay? If you are using the micro kernel, Mahu, it has a very limited the number of processes, but the sum of the the process monolith. The operating system put everything. They will automatically create the child process for the that are needed for your system. Then each process they will be processed by what? Main goal is the CPU. Okay. CPU is the main part of the computer system. They need to access this one, which means. CPU operating system should know what process are available, what kind of program are running, okay? Which one will be accessed by the CPU? Which one is not, okay? To differentiate such a status of the each process, the operating system define the different state of the process first. When a process is created, created means started, you can double click or you can the type the command that is the new process state. So new. Okay. So that is in other words, if your the program is loaded into the memory, then that is the new state. So any program, any processes that are loaded into the memory is a created, that is the new. Then once it's loaded, if you, if the process is ready, okay, then this does not mean the CPU is recognized that this one is loaded. So this, once this one is the loaded into the memory, process is loaded into the memory, then it's ready to get the CPU power, in other words, if the CPU is ready, it's not done yet, but ready to access the, ready to execute the instruction of the program, then it's moved to the ready queue. And you want ready? So it's a ready, okay? So ready, the difference between the ready and new is, new is just execution. Okay, into the it's a, just loaded into the memory. Nothing changes. Only just loaded into the memory. Okay, so you have just a set of programs are in the memory that is the red, the new state. Then, if the CPU is ready to execute, that is the ready queue. So right after new is just one time. Then the is moved to the ready. However, even though I'm saying that it's a move. The process is not moving around, okay? The move, I will sh the explain later. It's a status, state of each process. So for example, this is the first time the new, then it's a change it to the ready, okay? So ready. So in the ready, how many the process are ready? There are many, okay? 
So we have the many, ready, ready, ready. So we are going to manage such a the number of process who are ready in the queue. What is a queue? First come, first, first out. The fee for data structure is similar as the stack, but it's a stack is last in first out. This is the first in first out. So this is used a lot in computer system. What? Simple and very fast. Is okay. it a normal queue or is it something else? That's what we are going to discuss. Okay. So normal queue is first in first out, which means if this one is the enter the ready queue, then this will be selected by the CPU first, right? Then if next, this one. What if this one is running forever? So we need to consider different algorithm anyway. So we will set aside how to select the process. So it's not just the normal first in first out. Definitely we need to consider different the algorithm, different rule to select the. So let's the assume the one of the process is selected. Okay? Selected for what? For the CPU is ready to execute the thing. The instruction that is called running state. As I'm saying, this is the process is not moving around in the computer system. It's just a change it, the there, ready, this is a ready, this is a ready, but this is a change to the run, running. Okay? Which means CPU is going to access the instruction of the, this process. How many? One. one. So one. If you have the multi-core and the multi-processor, the that's more complicated. We will discuss later. Okay? Just so one program, so a single core, the CPU, will select one program. So who is, so there are several questions already. Who is in charge of the, this one? Selection. CPU schedule. That is the part of your operating system, CPU scheduler, or it's called a dispatcher. Dispatcher. So dispatcher is a general name, especially that the, if you are implementing that selection algorithm that is called a CPU scheduler. So we will discuss later about the CPU scheduler. Also, it's your, the first project to implement the CPU scheduler. Actually, it's very simple. Which one is the very, the most simplest, the algorithm for the selection. Shortest job first. When you go to the McDonald's, so how does the register serve? First come, first serve. First one, first serve is the most used algorithm in the computer system. Why? It's a fair, right? And also, it's a simple and the easy to implement. So, even <coughs> one of the algorithms for the selection of the process from the ready queue to this one, that is a first in, first out. Okay, people algorithm. There are several. However, keep your mind, many, most, not all, most of the algorithms that we are going to discuss in this uh, the operating system class. Most of them are priority based. Even first come first serve is the priority. What is the priority? Reliable time, right? Time is the priority. If you are consider the length of the job, okay, then length is the priority, right? If you consider shorter job. How short is the priority? Okay. Sometimes you can specify the explicit specify the priority. This process is the highest priority. Zero. This is the lowest priority. Fifteen. Seven. You can specify anything actually priority based. Okay. So, but just to keep your mind, that it's easy to understand such a uh, algorithm. So we have the processor in the running the state. It's not the special location, it's the 
state of the each process. So this is a running, okay, which means CPU can access the instruction and data for this process. Then, sometimes the instruction is the integer i. Integer i is the system input, okay? System input, the user type. I forgot the name of the Java class name to get the input. What is the Java class name to get the input from the standard input? Scanner. Scanner. So like the scan. Okay? So at that time, what CPU can do? CPU need to wait until user input. Yes, right? It's not fair for the other process because the other process cannot get the CPU resource while this process is weak. And also, not only just the scanner, the user input, I need to read the data. Integer i is in the file. Okay? So using the scanner, so you can get the data from the file. You can open the file, file stream the in Java. So I need to read the data integer i from the file. What CPU can do? Can move to the next instruction? No. Right? Until you get the data from how can the CPU get the data? Interrupt. Using the, this time, interrupt the operating system, then inform to the controller. For example, the, in this case, a disk controller. So then give the address. High level address, high level address of the data, and this one convert the row level, the sector number, cylinder number, then finally access the data from the hard disk drive. Then, when this one get the data, interrupt operating system, then send the data to the memory, then finally CPU can read the data. During that time, what CPU can do? Process something else. Nothing, right? So it's not fair. So why don't we move the this the process just wait in the wait room until I find so when I'm advising the student. Okay? When I'm advising the student, I need a file. So if you guys need to wait until the my secretary bring the file from the file room, it's not fair. So the during that time the this process can wait in the wait room. So this is the wait status. Then there's no process in the, the this one is changing to the way. So no process is running. So this time we can use the this time for another process. Then this dispatcher will execute the CPU scheduling algorithm to select the one of the process from the ready queue to move to the, the running queue. Right? So there's a process in the way queue. Then when this state is changing, this one interrupt, then inform to the operating system. Operating system get the signal, there's a return the data. Can this one move back to the running queue right away? No. Instead, it needs to move to the ready queue and wait until. I know it's sometimes it's not fair, okay? But uh, this uh, overall, this is the algorithm used in the, the operating system, okay? So this one will move to the ready queue, then sometimes later it will be selected, okay? So new is a, when you execute the process, it's a new state, then if it's ready to be executed, that is moved to the, not moving, it's changing, the CPU state status. That is state that is already. So it's a, we are going to use the queue to manage a number of the process. Then one of them will be selected by the dispatcher using CPU scheduling algorithm. Okay? Then we don't discuss yet okay, how to select it. That will be the next topic that we are going to discuss in the chapter five. <coughs> chapter five. Okay? Then, the, if one of them is selected, that is running queue, that running queue that we have discussed many times how CPU process execute the instruction, so that is the 
one in Q. In case I/O, any uh, user input or the the file input and output, any input and output are, are needed. CPU cannot do anything. Okay, CPU basically process the data. Okay, process means uh, the execute the instruction. So during the I/O time, CPU cannot do that. So to utilize that time, we can the move the such a running queue to the wait queue, then the dispatcher will select another process to the maximize the utilization of the CPU. Then the, this one, it will move to the ready queue once the, the data, the, in, the input and output is the completed, will move to the this one. What if process from the running queue is done? Okay, process all the instruction or sometimes the user or the other application interrupt the sender signal, interrupt signal <coughs> that the, why don't you the stop your processing. So it's done. Anyway, no matter what happened, it's done. Then this one is no longer needed, right? The main problem of the computer management is the CPU. CPU we need for what? The speed, speed up, okay? That is the main reason to use the memory. But main problem is relatively small, okay? Expensive. So we'd like to maximize the utilization of the, the memory. So right after the process is done, we'd like to kick out of that process from the memory. So this process will be changed into the terminate state. So in case of the terminate state, we can free all the resources right away from the computer system, including memory and others. Okay? So these five are the basic state of the status of the process. Then another question, where can we manage such a status of each process? One way is we can make the big command table, okay? Whenever there is a change, it, we can update it. So it's easy to implement. Problem is it needs the storage and also it will be bottleneck because we need to the access every time for this. So most of operating system manage such a information as a part of process control block. The process control block is the data, another data structure to manage the each process. So in other words, if you create a new process, in other words, if you create the, the new state of the process, then the, this PCB will be created. Then will be managed by the operating system <coughs> in your the memory structure. It's a PCB structure. So we don't have to move entire, we don't have to move the entire the, the process information. The, instead, we can create the PCB structure for each process. That includes not only the this, the process state, some important information about the process. Like the student, if I have the many, the, not all information about the student, for each student, name, ID, and major, and the grade. So only the important information. So using that PCB, the operating system doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to access the each and every process. Instead, just access PCB for the process. This PCB will be used for to manage the process. So. For example, so what kind of information process state? That is the, what we discussed in addition to the process state. The process number, process ID. Yes. So when we create the process, the, uh, operating, the system code will return the process ID. We will see later how to create. We don't discuss how to create the process yet. We will see. So, but the, if we create the process, it will return ID and process number. That will be stored at the PCB also. Then 
program counter. Program counter is the where is the next instruction. It's the location of the next instruction next. Why? Because as you can see, process will not be right away terminated when they enter the running state. Instead, going back to the way, sometimes going back to the ready. It is possible to going back to ready instead of this one. Sometimes, interrupt signal. Whenever you have interrupt, interrupt means stop. The in signal to your operating system, I have something important information. Like the divide by zero, I have the return data, I have the received main, and stop. Then this process will go back to the ready queue. Then the dispatcher will select the next process name. So this process, each process will not be the execute at one time, stop and next. Resume, stop, resume, stop, resume. So operating system should know where is the next location. That is a program counter. What about the, this one? What is the register? Register should supposed to be here. Right? What is the, this one? What if? The this process has an IO way. So move to the this one, which means currently CPU use the register information for the this process, right? So this is a 10, 1, and something address X, the FFF, like that. Then if we bring the new process, this one is not needed. Okay? Right? So we need the new information about the process in the ready queue, which is selected. We need to process again to get the last image of the register. So it doesn't make sense. So instead, when a process is moved to from running state to other, we copy. Copy all of this register information to the PC also. So this is the last image of the register for this the process. Then once when this process is selected to the running queue, then we can copy this one to the, the register of the your CPU, then move to the execute the next instruction and next instruction. So that is another important the part of the PCB process control block. What about the memory? Memory limit? So we have seen the, uh, the, sub, the computer architecture that so each process can have the certain size of the memory and it can be dynamically increased the, the refer to the others. However, sometimes we need the limit or the, the uh, limit or the something the protection of the memory. Protection is another important part of the memory management because if you know the address of the memory, you can access the data. If you know the, the if you access the data, you can change it and modify the data. That causes a serious problem. Probably you have seen not nowadays, but uh, when you are using the 95 or the old version of Windows system. It shows that something, the memory, the problem, memory conflict or the lock problem, something like that, because illegally access the memory, other memory location. So that should be managed by which one is the my area limit of the memory in the PCB, and or any open file, because uh, what is the problem? So if you multiple process access the same the file, you cannot guarantee what is the output. Sometimes, so if you allow the many process access the same file, so it will be messed up. So it's a synchronization issue. So we are going to manage such a all, like the accounting information. So if you want to build the, or we, so you host, you create a cloud computing system. So I'd like to be to my user. How do you know which user used 
the how much the CPU resource or the memory resource using accounting information. This accounting information basically the based on the each process accounting information. You can keep such information in the PCB also. So any the information, important information about each process will be named by the such a PCB. Okay. That means in your the first project, the first project you are going to implement the CPU scheduler to decide the next process. Anyway, you need to know the information about each process. Sometimes when is arrival time, how long it takes, and what, how much it remains, something like that. So such information should be managed by the PCB. So first job of your project one later, I will explain the details, but the first job is define the PCB structure. It will, it will not be such a complicated because we are focusing only the CPU scheduling, okay? But still we need some of the information. So you need to define the, this one. Okay, this is the, our PCB, so we are going to use the PCB uh, to manage the process information. Any questions? Many students the overlook the importance of the, such a PCB. Even when you uh, are doing your the project in this class, so you can find some the existing source code, and later you can find a lot of CPU scheduler. But not many of them actually the consider such a, the PCB. You can manage separately, like the arrival time, the like the vector and the uh, remaining time another vector, but the, I'm going to take a look at whether you define such a PCB correctly or not. Okay, so this is a diagram that uh, simplified uh, this one. So this is the uh, scheduler. In, we will discuss about the, this scheduling algorithm dispatcher in chapter five, and the, the other Depending on the operating system, they have the different the state, but the basically this is the, the common the process state we can use. Then I already explained about the, what happened when we the uh, when we need to when a process in the running queue a running state move to the away uh, of the state, then we select another one. So then, that is called a context switch. So context switch is further regarding to the CPU. The CPU would like to maximize the CPU research. So without the idle time, the we, oh, by the way, what if we have the 100% the CPU research? the utilization. Is it good? No. 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 Why? Do you remember the our operating system is dual mode? Dual mode means user mode and kernel mode. Okay? So if you are using the one hundred percent of the CPU, okay, then there's no chance for kernel mode, kernel execute the there, the, uh, the function or the instruction. So we need to balance usually the user and the kernel mode. Usually it's recommended three to one, two to one to three to one. So which means the the sixty percent to the seventy five percent for the user mode and that the others are kernel mode. Okay. Then in case one hundred percent the utilization mostly. 100% of the user mode, which means infinite mode. So because of that, 100% is not the best case, but we'd like to increase the maximization, increase the CPU utilization, okay? To do that, we need to change whenever the process is moved away or the ready queue, we need to bring the another process to the uh, running queue, then change all the information that is called the context switch. So this slide shows how the context switch is uh, working. So let's say that we have the two process. Process 0 is a current process. Process 1 is the next selected process. So 
For example, at this time there's an internal OS system call, which means there's an IO, the request, something like that, then it's a stop. So, so that time the operating system will copy all the information about the register and the key update all information about the, this process, where is the current, the, pro, the program counter, then the next one is the, the uh, updated and any the current the inform any inform update any information about the PCB of the current process, then we can the bring the PCB find the PCB of the next process and copy load all the uh, register information and any other information mostly is a register the information then execute the next process. Okay, so we can. It is true, there is a little bit idle time between the, this one, so we cannot avoid this. Okay? Then, however, during the such uh, idle time because of the uh, IO weight, so we can utilize the uh, um, CPU for this. So this is called the context switch. So the more context switch is the better? No. no. Definitely not. Why? A lot of IO are required. You can see the main part of the context switch is uh, the copy, the, this one, into the memory. And bring the register information from the next PCB to this one. It requires a lot of IO. So that's also the less is the better. No. If you limit the such a less context switch, you can reduce, you may the lose the degree of the multi program. Okay? So you need to balance. Okay? That is who is in charge of such a to control the optimize the context switch. Using CPU scheduling algorithm. Okay? So using the CPU scheduling algorithm, you can balance. So but mostly so you can check the if you have a lot of the context width. So you can increase the degree of the multi-programming. However, the, your performance will be downgraded. So that is the, the context switch. This is a real example of the PCB data structure used in the Linux. So you, you, Linux, so you can find uh, such a data structure uh, uh, from the Depending on the Linux, it may be different, but this is the uh, general. The location includes the Linux, and this is a header file for the scheduler. So this is the PCB, the task on the bus truck. So you can see the counter and state, counter priority, and the flag, and it's debug information, and so on. So memory information, so it's um, much more than that. But the, if you want to add more, so you can the, add more, the compile, and use in your the system program. So this is the, the example of the PCB in Linux system. Okay. What about the drive? This is the general the process structure so far. What about the thread? What is the difference between the process and thread? Thread? Program. So anyway, the CPU is processing a thread of instruction. That is a thread. Okay. So when you have the just one thread of instruction, it's a simple. But sometimes we may have several thread, several functions, several class, several module. So we may have the several thread of the Instruction. So, you see process? No. But it's under the same process. But, you see the same code? No, it's a different code. But they are sharing many information. Okay? So, in the thread, so this is a part of the process, <coughs> but each process may have the several threads. Nowadays, it's getting more important. Why? Because we have a lot of multi-core system. So, which means if we have the multi-CPU or multi-core, each core is in charge of each thread, we can increase multi-processing.
problem, degree of the multi problem. Okay, so we will see details about the threat in the chapter four. It's very, if you understand the chapter three, so it's not a big deal. So we will see in the, about the threat. But this threat nowadays, the important for the multi level, pro, the multi degree programming, like the parallel programming also. Okay? What about the Java? How many process is creating when you run the Java program? Actually, it's basically one process for Java virtual machine. Then Java virtual machine will create, whenever you create a new the class, new class, <laughs> then the create the, even though you are creating the new process in your the uh, Java class, it's a thread. Okay? So under the Java virtual machine, it will create the thread. Because of that, for your practice, in your the warming up project, I'm not going to allow to use the Java. Okay? So instead, the so main part of the warming up pro the warming up project is whether you can create the process using system core, whether you are able to communicate each other. That is the main thing. Okay? So Java is too nice for the my student to practice. Okay? So why don't you use the other program language as long as it's a code. graphical user interface is not needed. Just the, the uh, command line interface, you can just print out the output and input. So that's the problem. Next class, the uh, next week, GA will introduce the little bit more the requirement of the uh, warming up project. Then we already discussed about the uh, process, the scheduling. Then, so we are going to any question? Question? No. So we need to select the process from here. The two to get the CPU resource. However, there are several different levels of the scheduler in operating system. Whenever we have the queue, queue is the data structure to manage the many data items, right? Many processes. For example, ready queue. Ready queue is here. And the device queue. Each device has the, their own queue. Why? Because there are many requests from the, the processes and application to access the data. So this one needs to manage the queue. And also, in operating system level to the move to change from the new to ready queue, okay? Operating system also manage the it's kind of admission to the operating system. Admission is so whether this process is selected to get the CPU resource, that is called the job queue. So there are different levels of the scheduling queue, especially for the such a job queue. It's like the, uh, how many times job queue? So selection of the process in the system, which means once it is selected, it will be running. Okay, only one time. So so one time will be selected. However, what about the ready queue? So frequently happen. Many times. And also, duration of the uh, execution. After it's uh, selected, it's uh, usually long term, right? Until it's uh, terminated. What about the ready queue? Selected and several the microsecond get the CPU resource. Then going back to the ready queue, what I wait. Then selected again and get. So, so frequently, the selected, frequently scheduled. So there are different levels. So you, we, usually we call <coughs> the short-term scheduler and long-term scheduler. Short-term scheduler is the scheduler that you know, okay? That we discuss. It's a CPU scheduler. On the other hand, the also operating system manage the scheduler. It's a long-term scheduler which job will be selected. Such a long-term scheduler, example of the long-term scheduler is like the printer. Printer usually 
use the pool of the job. Can you divide your printing job slides page by page or the second by second or minute by minute? We cannot do that. Once the job is selected, it should be printed no matter how many pages. 200 pages, 300 pages. So you have the, the print of pool. Then the, it's a, also the pool, then the scheduler will select the job. Mostly first come first up, the first serve, but first come first the printed, but there may be the priority to print out. Okay? Then at that time that is the long term scheduler. Once it's selected, should be done, it's usually long term. Mm -hmm. However, CPU scheduler, we can slice the execution. It's usually millisecond or microsecond. It's a frequently happen. So that is the uh, short term scheduler. The, in the diagram, we can understand such, using the queuing diagram, we can understand such a long term and the short term scheduler. Right? The, from the long term is the from the heap here, it is the selected and go to the CPU. CPU scheduler will select the uh, process from the ready queue. This is the short term scheduler. And also, each device has the, their own the queue and their own scheduling. So this is the uh, process of scheduling. When we poke a child, yeah. does it go to a new state or does it go to ready state? Direct? So we will discuss it in the next. Okay. So that's the obviously you should have a curiosity. So what about the, this one? <laughs> the next. So we will see how. As I said, we didn't discuss yet the how to. Then the, if we poke and if we access it, what is the process state? Okay. So this is a short-term scheduler, and this is a long-term scheduler. So well, we are going to discuss about the, such a characteristic of the process when we discuss about the scheduler in chapter 5. So we can divide the process job into two parts, two characteristics. One is process, the CPU-bound job, like the add, substrate, move, so instruction. On the other hand, the many of the most of the process need to access the data from IO devices. During that time, CPU cannot do anything. So we can divide the process characteristic IO bound versus CPU bound. Because of this one, we can get the benefit of the CPU scheduler. Don't overlook. Uh, don't pay the. Do not exaggerate the power of the CPU scheduler. CPU scheduler cannot increase the CPU time. CPU time is a time. Like the, our time, right? Can you increase time? No. So time is time. CPU is the same thing. But we try like to maximize. Not 100% without losing the performance. The maximize the CPU utilization. So that is the uh, idea of the CPU scheduler. We will discuss more about the, this one in chapter 5. Okay? So, there are mid -term, medium term scheduler because during the once the job is using the job scale long term scheduler select, then that will be selected by short term scheduler, right? But low all the operating system, all the computer system has a very, very limited memory space. What if we need more space to execute? There's no available. So we need to bring this out temporarily, not terminate the temporarily bring out, kick out the process from the memory to hard disk drive. Okay? So that is called the swap. We will see during the it's a memory management issue. But so that is uh, if you, your system has a such a swap in and out, that is the meter because it's not like the Job scheduler is not like the uh, CPU scheduler. It's kind of in between, so it's called a medium term scheduler. It's not used nowadays, okay? Because it needs huge input and output. Also, relatively, we have enough bigger space of the memory. However, still we are using the swap for what? In virtual memory, okay. 
So if you go to the my computer in the Windows system, you can change it, the size of a virtual, the memory. Nowadays, even it's not critical, but the, until the Windows, previous Windows version, the unit, you can allocate two or three times of your physical memory as a virtual memory. So virtual memory is uh, nowadays the another technique to uh, manage the memory space. Okay? So we will see the, how to do that. At that time, we call the such a space as the swap space, but the, the swapping is not used a lot nowadays because of a lot of the iron. But if we consider such a swap in and out, that is called the medium term schedule. Okay. What about the mobile system? It's the same thing? Basically the same thing because it's anyway computer system and it has the operating system. Even their operating system is based on Linux. The Linux system is basically the same and system. What is the main if we the differentiate the this one and this one, what is the main different thing? Power. Power management issue. Which one is, the, if you check the application, that can check which application used a lot of the, your power. What is the top? Which one used the most? Screen. Display. It says display screen. Okay? So, because of that, until nowadays, it's getting the close to the, this one. It's almost the same. They do not limit. But the old version of, the iOS and Android, especially the iOS version 4, so they limit a number of process for the, this one. Only one process, only full run, okay? Only one process can be ready, and the other is deactivated. But nowadays, they change it, is that they have the foreground and background concept, which are the same as the, the operate the Linux and the Windows <coughs> system. The, however, their idea is slightly different. Foreground means display. Background is still running, but it's not display. Okay? If your application does not need the display, but should be running continuously, that is considered as the service. Yeah, that is the service. So it's actually the same idea, but focusing on what? Display. So in other words, so if you can make the battery enough power, so you will be super rich. I think the richer than the Zuckerberg. So that can last uh, a month. Okay? No? Not possible? <laughs> Anyone from the electrical engineering? Do you don't think about the battery? So it may be possible, right? Because uh, when I used the smartphone first time, nobody expected such a uh, small size of the battery, really. So I read, uh, at the time I read the article, they said uh, the, the size of the uh, battery for the two year, 20 years later, 30 years later, is like the, the what is that, cartoon, either. Cigarette box, one cigarette box size, because at the time the smartphone, portable phone is like a, this much, like a brick. But it's a very small, so who knows? Okay. So what time? Is it end 11.30? 11.45 already? So from now on, the, from the next class, let me know five minute people. <laughs> you should be here. Okay. So we will continue the process management. I explained a little bit in details about it. But the next class, so because we discussed the most of the important part, uh, I'm going to speed up and try to manage the, the process. Part. Especially for the creating the and book and exe system code is more important the, than in your the programming. Any questions? Okay, thanks so much and I'll see you next class.